さあそれではお時間となりました So now we'd like to start the program So we'd like to start the international IPS cell、uh, symposium, public symposium of、uh, future and IPS cell. Thank you. Good evening, good afternoon. And also, if you watch the internet channel, and this is the、uh, Japan Science、uh, Future Organization. Thank you for coming. To, and this is the public symposium of the international IPS. Cell and it's titled as IPS Cell and a Future, and this event continues for two hours. I'm in charge of MC. Science My name is Keiji Sonoguchi. I am the、uh, science communicator. And for this event, is the IPS Cell. In this IPS Cell, Is the one of, we see a new tool for the human being. What kind of future do we face? And what kind of lifestyles do we lead in the future? And this is an event to think about those issues. And this event is the link to his Twitter. This is a hashtag that if you can, based on this, you can tweet. And please participate in the event in this way by using Twitter. So, Let me briefly、uh, introduce this word. Hello, world. Does it any ring a bell in your mind? How many people would have、uh, clicked your bell? Yes, some of you. Well, this means, hello, world, for the new computer language when it is learned. The programming、uh, novice, a beginner, is the,、uh, to display this word on the screen and was a hello world. Why I'm saying this is、uh, talking about the computer because in this,、uh, this is the English title of today's program Science to Access Cellular Programs、uh, is the title of this program today. So, We can access to the programs of, of cells by science. And this is the, what we, I like to take, we like to talk about today. So, we will talk about biotechnology, accessing cells, and hello world that I like to briefly talk about this. So, that's why. This is my cell, the picture. Have you ever seen? The cell picture before? Maybe one third of you may have seen this type of picture. And you may think this is difficult to take this picture. Actually, it's very easy. You can just use cotton swab and into, get into the cheek uh, uh, muc mucosa,、uh, mucus to be、uh, wiped. And then with the optical microscope and some of the dye. Dying agent could be used to see, get this type of picture. This is a hollow world, the first step to the accessing the cell. And then there's the programming and the cell that are linked together. It may not be linked、uh, to some of you, but please look at this picture. So we have、uh, started from the one single cell, and then with the Cell proliferation, we would,、uh, this cell proliferation is done in a very regular manner based on this program of the cell. That cell has a program to do this、uh, cell pro proliferation. And, and it's not just one cell we have, we have more than 200 types of cells and many types of cells in the, in the body. And so there is a different role to be shared by different cells. And that is also determined by the program. This cell division is done by that way. We have invited Dr. Ian Wilmot in the egg cell or embryo cell and linked to this special power that embryo cell has. And Dr. Yamanaka, second speaker, is talking about this also links to these different roles we played by the different cell. 
and to resetting or reprogramming that cell function. Now we'd like to invite two doctors, uh, two speakers today. Since 1996, uh, she, he has started with a dolly, the clone sheep, and Dr. Ian Woodmutt. And then after 10 years, in 2006, establishing the IPS cell, Dr. Shinya Yamanaka of the Kyoto University. Thank you very much. So, uh, please have a seat. So, first of all, the first speaker, uh, in 1996, the clone sheep, Dolly, was born by his research, uh, Dr. Ian Wilmot. Uh, Dr. Uh, Sir uh, Ian Wilmot, please uh, come to the stage to make the presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your very warm welcome. It's a great pleasure to be here to be able to describe the research to you and show the way in which it led to the later production of IPS cells. What I want to do is to tell you, first of all, a little bit about me and how I became involved in research. And then I'll describe the cloning method and how it led to the IPS cell methods that Professor Yamanaka developed. When I was a boy, when I was growing up, there was nothing in my world which suggested biological research. My parents were both teachers. I lived in three cities, none of which had a university. So I had no experience, no suggestion of universities, academic research of any kind. As many young people do, I wanted to travel and I wanted to work outside, see the world. And so I went to university to learn about farming, thinking that I could then take modern technology from my country to the poorer countries in the world with less developed agriculture, help to feed people and went to university with that ambition. When I was at university, for the first time I saw research laboratories. For the first time I had classes which showed me embryos and things developing. Made me ask questions about what is it that lets the single cell of an embryo become all of the different tissues that make up a person. An amazing process that we take for granted. And so I decided that maybe it would be a good idea to spend a summer vacation working as an intern in a laboratory to gain experience to see what the life was really like in a university laboratory and was very fortunate to be accepted by this professor who was a very distinguished professor of reproductive biology in Cambridge. He was the first person to show that some chemicals can protect cells during freezing and thawing, a technique which we use now to freeze blood and semen, all sorts of different cells. And that two-month period in a laboratory in Cambridge changed my life. Because it was clear to me that this was a fantastically exciting way of life, doing new and different things all the time, perhaps producing things, hopefully producing things which would be useful. My second piece of good fortune was that he had a vacancy a year later 
So when I graduated, I was able to go back and work with him to develop a method of freezing pig semen. Because at that time it wasn't possible. And it was because there is a structure on the sperm pointed out which is very sensitive to freezing and thawing in pigs. And so after three, four years, we had developed a method which provide, provided particular protection to that part of the, the sperm. We then had another piece of good fortune. My wife and I had planned to travel to Australia and spend a few years there as a visitor working on a different area of research. And we had been told that money would become available at the time when I finished my PhD. But just at that time, we were told that it was not available for at least six more months. And to a couple with a young family, six months with no money is a, a long time. My supervisor was starting a project to freeze embryos, which at that time nobody had frozen successfully. And he had offered the position to somebody who had a job in an English university. But he thought about it. He had a permanent job in that university, and he was being offered a three-year post in a very exciting area of research, but only for three years. And he decided that to him at that stage, security was more important than excitement. And so he said he wouldn't take the job. And I was offered that opportunity, having worked freezing one type of cell, to stay and freeze another type of cell. This gave me the opportunity to work with another very distinguished biologist who taught me a lot about how to recover embryos from animals and to transfer them back into a different animal successfully so you had a good chance of producing a pregnancy. A basic tool which I then used for the rest of my research career to understand different aspects of biology and to make changes. And we were also successful in producing the first calf from a frozen embryo called Frosty. And you can see this was in June 1973. And it gave me my first exposure to television cameras and the media who were interested in this technique. Remember, I was very fortunate. The only reason I had the job was because the first person it was offered to decided not to take it. Because of my experience with both male reproduction, sperm, recovering and transferring embryos and storing them, an animal institute in Edinburgh, known as Roslyn Institute, invited me to take a post there. And I moved to Edinburgh and stayed in that institute for more than 30 years doing different projects. These pictures illustrate one of the projects which was carried out in 1985, 1989 and several years. At that time people had begun to identify particular genes, particular segments of the chromosome which had particular effects and were putting different genes into animals to study what they did and hopefully to change the animals so that they did something to their benefit or to our benefit. And one of our projects was to add a gene into sheep so that they made protein which can be used to treat a particular human disease. And this picture, I'm not sure if you'll be able to see it, 
but it shows a nucleus here and there is a pipette coming into that nucleus. And the technique is very simple. You inject a few hundred copies of the gene into that nucleus and sometimes it will be integrated into the chromosomes and will function normally. And before Dolly, this was probably the most famous sheep called Tracy because she produced a very large quantity of a protein called clotting factor 9 which can treat some forms of haemophilia a very unpleasant disease in which people bleed can't stop bleeding this was a, a collaborative project with the gentleman shown here who was a molecular biologist So this is a, had established that we could make human proteins in milk. Other people made them in, in the milk of cattle where you had a, a bigger volume. But the method was seriously limited. Less than 1% of the eggs that we injected had genes which functioned normally. They were called Whoops, whoa. <laughs> these working these things is much more complicated than cloning. But the main limitation of this technique was that you can only add a gene. What we wanted to be able to do was change genes to make more accurate changes in order to be able to look at what the product of that gene did in the animal. And preferably we wanted a more efficient technique than this which was only successful in 1% of the cases. But nonetheless it was a success and with the director of the institute I went to a meeting in Dublin so that he could talk about the, the work. And whilst I was there, I had another piece of good fortune. Actually, in a bar, having a drink, drink of beer. When I heard about some work which had been done by this gentleman, Steen Willardson, who is a Danish scientist who was working in the United States. He was the first person to produce cloned sheep and then cloned cattle. So the lamb at the back here was one of the first cloned sheep ever produced. But what I heard in that bar conversation was that he had been successful in cloning from the stage of embryos from which we get embryo stem cells. So when we flew back to Edinburgh, I said to my boss that if this was true, and if we could grow embryo stem cells from livestock, then we might be able to change the genes in those cells to make a precise genetic change, and then do nuclear transfer from them which would, for the first time would create an opportunity to change animals in that way. I happened to be going over North America a few months later and I stopped to see Steen by then working in Canada and he was a very good friend. He told me yes it was true and all the details of his methods, how he had done it and he gave me all the technical knowledge I needed to bring the method back to Edinburgh, which was very generous of him. So you can see how over this period of time, several pieces of good fortune affected what I did and made a big difference to my life. And I think you have to be prepared to take those pieces of good fortune and use them. What I now want to do is to
describe nuclear transfer to you. To do nuclear transfer, you need two cells, one of which is an egg recovered from an animal around the time when normally it would be mated. And you have to remove the chromosomes from that egg. And it's shown schematically here. These are the chromosomes which are together, grouped together at the edge of the egg at this stage. And I'm going to show this to you as a, on a movie in a few moments, but this is just a diagram showing how you use a pipette to remove those chromosomes. You need a second cell which will provide the chromosomes to control development. And it's these cells which we could later on go on to change. So I've used a, a different color just to, to make that point. And you use the same pipette to pick up one of these cells and to put it next to the egg. Eggs, mammalian eggs do actually have a shell. And so you can see that the cell is placed between the shell and the cell. And what we do in our method is to use an electric current to, free, to fuse these two cells together as a way of introducing the nucleus, the chromosomes, from one cell into the other. And it's this nucleus which will then control the development of the, of the sheep in this case. So this is a movie, as it happens, of nuclear transfer in sheep made by my colleague Bill Ritchie. And these are sheep eggs recovered from an animal a few hours previously. They're about one-tenth of a millimeter in diameter. You need a microscope to see them. So he's working with a, a machine and a microscope to do all of these changes. One difference you can see immediately is you can't see the chromosomes in this egg. But we know that they're going to be next to this body here. So the pipette will come in into the egg and then pick up this section here because we expect that the chromosomes will be there. The egg has been incubated with a dye a compound which binds to the chromosomes and fluoresces in UV light. So the egg has been moved away so it isn't harmed by the UV light and you can see that this time Bill was successful in getting both groups of chromosomes. If he doesn't see them both then he has to try again or discard the egg. So he now picks up maybe 10 or so cells. Normally he would do this procedure to 10 eggs at a time. We're just showing you one process of removing the chromosomes. This is the same pipette so, so you can see straight away that these cells are much smaller. The egg is by far the biggest cell. So now he wants to put a cell. I hope you can see that there's a cell there in the pipette. He wants to put it into the space here. It's just arrived. I mentioned that we fuse the cells together so the last thing he does is to press the two cells together so that fusion is more likely to take place. Just one more time. You can see a cell just arrived there, and that's the cloning process. Cloning had been done for a number of years, 30, 40 years beforehand in frogs, because their eggs are so much bigger and easy to manipulate. And this is a famous photograph showing an experiment in frogs. You can see that the adult frog that, that gave the eggs is green and all the little ones are white because the cell, cells that we use to make these frogs 
were from a white strain. So as soon as you see these little frogs, you know that they must have been cloned. They couldn't have been produced by this animal by ordinary reproduction. It's a standard early test. You can see there are many small frogs. This is because the cells that were used came from a very early stage when the process is quite efficient. But if you go out to a later stage of development, the efficiency decreases steadily. And there has never ever been an adult frog cloned from an adult frog. Despite the fact that some very, very experienced biologists have tried for many years to achieve that, there is no clone from an adult frog. But nonetheless, it was this which suggested to people that cloning in mammals would be possible, at least to some extent. You'll have realized, of course, from what I've said already, that this is a project which needs a team of people with different skills. And so I'm going to show you pictures of them. This is the name of the lady who took these photographs, which are in the National Portrait Gallery in, the, in Edinburgh. This is Bill Ritchie, who I mentioned to you, who did almost all of our manipulation. This is his microscope, and it's not easy to see it, but this is the equivalent of a joystick used in computer games. It's this which was moving the pipette you could see in the movie. You would know that it requires great concentration and very careful work to do what you've just seen on the movie. And he might attempt to do nuclear transfer with 200 eggs in a day and be successful perhaps half of the time to make 100 embryos. It's very hard work, very skilled. Once you've made an egg, an embryo, you have to give it the chance to develop, to become a lamb. And these are the two people who carried out the surgery most of the time. John was the anesthetist, and you can see the sort of anesthetic equipment which was used, which is very similar to what would be used on us uh, in a hospital. And the same sort of instruments and the same basic approach to, to surgery. And of course, Many of the older women in this audience will know that during pregnancy, the health of the baby is monitored very carefully by ultrasound. And we used exactly the same approach to looking at the developing fetus in the sheep. So John is holding the scanner against the belly of the sheep. And you can't see it very clearly, but there is a, a screen over here which would show whether or not there was a fetus developing normally or not. And they were scanned at regular intervals, more frequently towards the end of pregnancy. You may have wondered where the name Dolly came from. Some of you may remember that the cell that was used to make Dolly came from mammary gland. And it was one of these two men who came up with the idea of christening the sheep after Dolly Parton, the singer, but who was also well known for her figure. These men looked after their mothers seven days a week, 24 hours a day, because they sometimes had difficulty giving birth. And it was obviously very, very boring to do that over a long time. And they must have had, I think, some very interesting conversations. So, July 1996, Dolly was born. This is her, of course, as a, an adult. We were successful because we found better ways of bringing the two cells together. I'd be happy to discuss that if anybody wishes to know. But she was, as I've just said, produced from a cell taken from a mammary gland of a sheep 
of a breed which has this white face. All of the other sheep in the experiment have black faces. So the same as in the frog experiments, we knew immediately that she was what we were waiting for. She was a cloned animal. She was very healthy, fertile. She had a total, I think, of six lambs over several years. But unfortunately got a virus infection which gave her a lung cancer. And it became to the point where it was kinder to end her life than to let her suffer anymore. There is no treatment for that uh, cancer. It's nothing whatsoever to do with cloning. It's just she was obviously too close to an unhealthy sheep at some point. So what did the birth of Dolly, what opportunities did it create? And they're summarized on this diagram. Clearly we could make copies of animals. We could make genetic changes in animals. We could perhaps get stem cells from cloned embryos, including human embryos. And it gave us new knowledge. There's never been any success in cloning any primate. So, so this is not possible. I'd like to take the opportunity to discuss with you a little bit these two new opportunities. I already introduced you to Tracy, who we produced by adding in a gene. What this let us do was to change genes and my colleagues used our new method to introduce a gene into uh, the animals more efficiently. So it's the same idea, but more efficiently. We could also use it to, to study human disease and possibly to produce organs for transplantation into people. But I don't want to discuss that anymore. What I want to do is to describe in more detail somebody else's project. This is not our research research carried out in the United States. The results are described in publications. To produce human antibodies. It would be very useful to have antibodies from people to inject into patients if the antibodies were against a cancer or an infection which was not being defeated by the uh, patients own antibodies and so what they did was to introduce the genes which produce antibodies into cattle by the, the method which I've described to you and then clone to make uh, animals and to produce antibodies in this way so although they're from cattle they are human proteins So what, what we wanted to do was to try to understand what it is in the egg which makes the changes to the nucleus. What this method does is to put a nucleus from one cell into an egg and it's changed. And I think there's an illustration as to what happens if we think about computers. If you have a computer and you take a computer program and put it into the computer, you give it a new ability, you change it. You haven't changed the processor, you've given new instructions as to how the processor should work. And what it made many of us think, including Professor Yamanaka, is could we find ways of mimicking this effect by putting proteins, whatever it is, into, whoa, into the cell in different ways. We're used to doing this by putting proteins outside the cell. What he has done is to find ways of putting proteins into the cell. An opportunity, I think, which was created, stimulated by 
this Dolly experiment. So it's a way in which an experiment can make you think differently about something totally unexpected, unfortunately for the benefit of us all. Thank you very much. IPS cell now from the Kyoto University. Dr. Professor Shinya Yamanaka. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm from Kyoto. My name is Yamanaka. I'm pleased to meet you. And as Dr. Wilmot, has talked about the birth of Dolly and how he came to have the very easy to understand way to explain about the in 1997 Dolly was announced I was 35 years old when Dolly was announced I just finished my research in the US and I came back to Japan and I was just wondering what type of research I was trying to do I was not too sure but then, at that time, I heard about the birth of Dolly in the journals called Nature. And Nature is the most uh, prestigious journal. And, and on the cover of that Nature magazine was a uh, picture of the sheep, the, do the Dolly. And I was, remember, I was so excited and moved by his research. And I really... Uh, respect uh, Dr. Wilmot for, and I was able to uh, talk. I never expected, I couldn't even dream that the, I was able to speak. I very, feel very honored to be with Dr. Wilmot. Uh, and Dr. Wilmot is very serious uh, person and very good researcher, as Dr. Wilmot is. And as he was just mentioning, the name of the dolly did you understand the name where did the dolly the, of the sheep came come from? The dolly was uh, getting the producing the milk, and this milk uh, um, is a new sheep born from the milk. And dolly is a famous uh, singer uh, in the and very good singer, and it not but also she's very famous. Her big uh, breast. And that is why uh, she was famous as being Dolly, and from that, the name Dolly was taken. He is a very uh, uh, serious person. He uh, tried and errored and uh, brought uh, Dolly f for the first time among any scientists in the world and he has lots of sense he has sense of humor as well and I respect him dearly um, Dolly was born in 1997 a mammary gland that was uh, contributing to the uh, production of milk but with uh, nuclear uh, transfer it was reset to work as a um, fertilized egg and clone a sheep was developed. It's a special technique. It's not for everyone. Uh, you need to have uh, certain skills to perform this uh, technique. Even with skilled uh, scientists, success rate was only 1 or 2 percent. So I was wondering, can there be any other ways to change the fate of cells with easier to use uh, technique? 
uh, divided. So, uh, will there be a, is there any possibility to reset the cell to work as a, a fertilized egg? There were many scientists who were trying to explore this topic. I came back to Japan and I was wondering what should be my next uh, theme. Um, I finally got my office all for myself and thinking hard what to do next. And I uh, decided this has to be it. Uh, um, I would like to find a way to modify the cells so that uh, we can use the uh, cells uh, to treat certain diseases. We could use a small part of uh, skin or blood cells so that we can treat people suffering from heart disease or other difficult diseases. If we reset the cell, divide its cells into the fertilized cell, we can transplant uh, the uh, cell for those who are suffering from diseases and make them healthier. That was the start of my research and it led to my IPS st cell research. What we are targeting through our um, IPS uh, cell is contribution to the medicine. I used to be a surgeon. 25 years ago, I graduated from uh, School of Medicine. I became an orthopedist. Doctors, um, at the, uh, I am very proud of uh, being a doctor. We can contribute to treat people who are suffering from diseases and injuries. But unfortunately, I was not good at uh, performing surgery. You have to be good at surgery to be a good surgeon. So after two, three years, I gave up on pursuing the path for being a good surgeon. But I once uh, dreamed to be a good doctor, so I never forgot my dream. I am pursuing uh, the AIPS uh, research, but ultimately I'd like the outcome of IP IPS cell to be utilized in the medicine. I, uh, one way is to use it in the regenerative uh, medicine, and the second is to identify uh, the cause of disease using IPS cell for the uh, discovery of new medicine. IPS cells, uh, you might have heard uh, the name, skin cell, a blood cell, are the origin of IPS cells. I will explain how to make them later. My IPS cells are produced. It's so easy. You take, uh, well, uh, you, there's skin cell or blood cell do not increase, but if we make IPS cells, you can increase them almost indefinitely. Skin cells are skin cells and blood cells are blood cells from the beginning until the end. But if you have IPS cell that was developed from skin cell, you can make a heart cell, arm cell, nervous cells. All different kinds of cells can be developed using IPS cells. You can proliferate and make uh, all kinds of different organs. Such a wonderful cell can be produced from skin cells and blood cells. That is the technology or technique of IPS cell. Sorry, I couldn't hear the question. 
because he was not using the microphone. He asked, "What kind? How many types of cells can be developed from iPS cells? In our body, there are more than 200、uh, kinds of cells. So theoretically, from iPS cell, all these 200 plus cells can be developed because、uh, iPS cells are very close to the、uh, fertilized." Cell, everything develops from fertilized cell. So theoretically, all the cells in our body can be recreated. All the researchers and scientists are working hard to、uh, think about how to develop heart cell or、uh, myocardial cell, etc. Muscles, hearts.、Uh, these cells have been developed success successfully. Uh, but uh, people are still working on development of、uh, hepatic cell or pancreatic cells. But I'm sure that with、uh, so many people working on this research, the cells of these different organs will be available soon. Excuse me.、Uh, since、uh, the Image is shown, so I will show it. This is one example: iPS cell from skin cell is now developed into heart cell.、Uh, the original cell was only a few millimeters. It was uh, uh, changed into、uh, iPS cell, and then this heart cell. There is a, a dish for in,、uh, culture. Tens of uh, uh, hundreds of、uh, bigger cells can be developed from a few millimeters of skin cell. Sorry, the heart cell stopped. The skin cell,、uh, what used to be a skin cell, is、uh, palpating, make or、uh, beating like a heart. It's very uh, uh, unique. That is the technique of、uh, developing iPS cell. Now let me explain uh, the uh, method to develop iPS cell. The ingredients are our skin cell or blood cell. The red-colored、uh, genes. There are four on the screen. These four genes are introduced into the cell simultaneously. Introducing genes into the cell. You may think it's difficult, but with a small、uh, agent and with a small tool, you can do it yourselves. After taking a 30-minute lesson, you can do it. Every year, we have new students、uh, who never had experience experiments. They come to. The university around April in July already they are making iPS cells. It takes about one month、uh, for a skin cell to develop into iPS uh, inter induced uh, uh, pluripotent uh, stem cell. iPS was short. It takes about one month to make iPS cells, but anyone can、uh, make iPS cells. It's a simple technique. Uh, you need four genes.、Uh, these are called initializing、uh, genes. How did I discover these four genes? In 1999, I started my research, and about five years, I was working very hard, and finally, I identified 24 candidates. We have about thirty thousand genes in our body. Out of thirty thousand, I narrowed down to twenty-four candidates, and twenty-four genes are introduced into skin cell simultaneously. The frequency is low, but、uh, we I could uh, make 
uh, IPS. So uh, towards the end of 2005 or early 2006, so I was certain that necessary genes were in the 24 candidates. I didn't think all these 24 genes were necessary, but uh, I knew for sure that there are uh, the final candidates in the 24. If I knew how many were needed ultimately, for example, I needed three or four, uh, I could have uh, tried all the possible combination, but I wasn't sure. There could be two, there could be three or four or five. If were, I were to try all the combination, that would be too much. So what I have done is the just take use one out of the 24. So those 23 remaining are the skin cells, so that the, I have done such experiment. So if you take out the, all the necessary cell, then even if you have the 23 that is necessary, you will not be able to make the iPS cell. So from this, we are able to find the four reprogramming genes. And first in, uh, first in the mice, mouse, uh, skin cell was changed to the iPS cell. And that report was possible by then. And thanks to the help of these, in the following year, I was able to do the same thing uh, for the human being as well. And today, I am representing, talking about iPS cell, but in reality, in these, not myself, but these other, my colleagues and young researchers and student in my research lab, and technical staff to help us ex do the experiment. And those are the people who are the leading players of the generating iPS cell. Especially these three people are even the father of iPS cell. And Tokuzawa-san and Mr. Takahashi is the one of my two first two students. And Ms. Ichisaka is a technical staff in my research lab. Thanks to these three people's help, we, I met them in 2000, in 1999. At the end of 1999, I was able to have my own research lab, and I collected, uh, and many students and the researchers have joined me, and also uh, joining of the new technical staff. And from the very early stage on, thanks to be able to having to work as a team uh, with these staff and, and other uh, researchers, I was able to do this uh, uh, making iPS cells. iPS cell is a very simple technology from four factors and also skin or blood cells and then from feeder cells which uh, to grow the iPS cell. These three are combined and then just put them in the medium in about 10 centimeter uh, plate like this and then give them uh, incubating agent uh, solution to be given so that it can be put in the medium like this. And this is adding the four factors to in plastic plate uh, or the we use that uh, tools, all the four factors that I just mentioned to skin cells and, and, and including nutrition and, and those uh, nutrition uh, liquid is given to incubate. It's very simple, but then, and then every change mediums uh, every other day. And other than that, we don't have to do anything, but then we just wait. But then if you view, look at the cells through a microscope, initially, the skin cell, initially, only have skin cells, but then the four factors are given there. And then after two weeks or so, you can see small babies or small cell colonies of the small IPS. And then after one month, you can see the, this size of the cell. And even with the human eyes, you can see the IPS cell colonies. At this stage, at day 30, then you can immediately proliferate even more, 10 centimeters or so plate from starting from that. 
but then it can expand to tens, hundreds, or one thousand. If you have money and space, you can even expand it to ten thousand or even hundred thousand. And then after that proliferation, you can create those、uh, hearts, heart cells and other cells in the organs possible. So these fifteen days, but ultimately speaking, it be thirty days to make this. In the meantime, the skin cells or blood cells now changed. Then it was skin.、Uh, it was、uh, skin, or it was、uh, blood. That information is forgotten, and then after that, the from compared to the、um, mating egg, that is similar to that mating egg status. In about one month period, it takes about one month or so, but it will proceed in a secured way. There will be some intermediary changing cells to reach normal iPS cells. At the, sometimes、uh, we have the not succeeding one cells, and the, my research is how can we increase this ratio of the complete normal iPS cells, and to prevent from this. Uh, differentiation resistant、uh, resistance iPS cells. My father used to work in creating the components for a sewing machine in a small factory, and there are good ones, of course, but not so good ones, such as with some scratch and components, and that is be eliminated in the quality check stage. So it is somewhat similar. I'm doing a similar type of work in what my father used to do. In this, using the same process, but we have the good quality ones, but then not so good quality ones, bad ones. And how can we、uh, filter out such、uh, poor quality ones? And now we have been almost come to the completion stage to be able to reduce or eliminate such poor quality ones. And using this cell, how can how can we contribute to the medicine? Is one first one is regenerative medicine. In the iPS cell, is when it is produced. For example, fortunately, I am very healthy. But let's say if I have a, a disease, the、uh, heart disease. Let's say if I have a heart disease, and I am able to stand like this. But if I, if I, as a hypothesis, I, I be a, a heart failure, that I may not be able to stand and stand up because of that. If I have the heart transplantation, then I may be able to recover. But in Japan, for the heart transplantation in Japan, it is only only 10 or 20 cases of the heart transplantation. Most of the patients are still waiting, and while they wait, they would die or pass away because they could not receive heart transplantation. But using this technology, we may be able to, from using the skin、uh, or blood cells. Of the cell, and then to convert that to the iPS cell to proliferate that cell, and then to be able to generate the heart cell, my own heart cell from my own cell. In my, of course, my heart is in a poor condition because of its heart disease. But then, if you use the via iPS cell, then it can reset or reprogram. To, it's almost like you've been put back to the baby stage, so you will be able to have the condition of before, so that you be before getting the sick. So that is the old, older uh, before uh, the heart cell can be produced without the disease. So the organ transportation is quite difficult, but then using the heart cell created from the iPS cell can be transplanted into me. So that you can, I can recover. I may be able to recover the heart function, and that is what has been researched right now. This is called regenerative medicine. But then those who are poor, there are many people who has a poor heart, bad heart. But to make the iPS cell、uh, to create the、uh, heart cell, it takes a huge cost and time to do that, because、uh, it's probably more than 10 million yen money per person. An iPS cell. If you proliferate and increase the iPS cell, it takes at least for half a year or one year to be able to proliferate that, and then I may not be able to do that、uh, pass、uh, pass away because of the disease. So how can we prevent such a problem? 
and how can we prevent from that problem. That is why I am thinking of and doing the plan to do the IPS cell stock because not from the, own, the patients themselves but rather from the healthy volunteers to get the skin or blood getting that from the uh, uh, healthy volunteers to make the IPS cell stock or heart cell stocks, heart IPS cell, uh, create heart, heart, heart uh, cell stock. But then one of the big pro problem is not the patient's uh, uh, cell, so there may be some resistance. In case of blood, you have the blood transfusion. If you get the blood from other people, uh, transplanted the, the blood fusion, then you have the resistance. But in case of blood, you have the type A, B, or O. By matching the blood type, you can prevent from uh, resistance uh, to reduce the minimum level of the resistance to the blood. So heart cell and the new neural cell, you need to uh, match them that is the HLA type uh, donors, and this is the this is like the blood of the cell, because in case of blood, if you have the four different types of the blood, you can match to everybody by depending on type. But HLA is quite more complicated. It has the more than tens of thousand types of the HLA. We if we have hundred or two hundred people like this, HLA type, you may have, you would not have the same HLA type. Even with the uh, one, uh, other people have the uh, uh, these have the stocks of the huge number of people be needed to create the exact same type of the HLA, and that is not really possible. However, in case of the blood uh, and the if it's a uh, O type O can receive from A B and AB, it can be transplanted. And in a similar way, and it was in a, previously he was talking about monozygotic twins. And the, and this is called, uh, uh, he's talking about the HLA hom homo donors. So for certain special type of the HLA type, it's almost like a blood type O, where it could be given to the other people without uh, problem so that you can have the huge number of stocks of the IPS cell, which could be transplantable for many patients. So according to my calculation, the special type of the HLA, in other words, very few or little resistance to this type of HLA, to find the 70 HLA homo uh, donors, then it should be able to cover and transplantable to 80% of the Japanese pe people uh, without any resistance. So how can we find these HLA homo donors and to receive cooperation to create the IPS cell? That is the plan that I'm planning to do. And since the time is limited for my speak, speech, so I'd like to finish my presentation. But as I mentioned before, IPS cell technology, as Dr. Ian Wilmot has mentioned about the birth of uh, Dolly and the and and IPS cell stock and the embryo from embryo. And this technology has now have come to this level in this research. Unfortunately, it is not yet useful for the actual patients yet. Maybe in five to 10 years or 15 years in the future, but still, depending on the disease type, there's a retina disease, a retina disease in the eye, it may be closer. For the heart, it may take a longer time. But still, we are steadily proceeding with our research so that these uh, regenerative medicine be possible. The reason why I became a doctor is a strong recommendation from my doctor. As I said, my father was running a small uh, factory. He was a owner of the factory, but also he was also uh, an operator making a small parts for sewing a machine. He had a small injury from his work, and he required transfusion of blood when I was a high school student. Because of this uh, blood transfusion, he uh, suffered from hepatitis, and his uh, uh, 
liver became worse. And as soon as I became a doctor, he passed away. He suffered a lot, I think. Uh, I was a osteo, a orthopedist. I could、uh, do transfusion myself. So before he died, I helped、um, treating my father. He was suffering a great deal, but、um, I, uh, looked, he looked quite happy to be treated by his own son. After my father's death, I gave up becoming a clinician and became a researcher. So he might be angry in the heaven. So. I would like to continue this research and make、uh, this iPS cell technology to contribute to the treatment of、uh, patients who are suffering from different diseases. In 10 years' time, 20 years' time, I'm not sure、uh, exactly when, but I'm sh-、uh, when I meet my father up there, I hope that he will praise、uh, what I did. Thank you for your kind attendance. Thank you for your presentation. I would like to. Read a question from、uh, Twitter.、Uh, there are many、uh, questions and comments、uh, via Twitter. I'd like to introduce one、A、question:、uh, embryonic clone and iPS cell. What are the differences in terms of、uh, what they can do?、Uh, Dr. Yamanaka, would you like to answer that question? Where shall I face? Can everyone hear me?、Uh, Dr. Wilmot's technique is a technology to develop,、uh, develop new animal using clone technology,、uh, used for genes for human,、uh, various、uh, proteins that can be used for treating diseases. Can be generated in large quantity. They can be generated in milk. Uh, uh, such develop,、uh, animals can be developed using clone technology. On the other hand, our iPS technology is not a technique to develop an individual、uh, person.、Um, we are. Developing、uh, cells, tissues,、uh, maybe in the future,、um, organs. At present, we are not able to produce organs, but we, by generating、uh, cells and tissues, we would like to contribute to the medicine. That is a big difference.、Uh, Dr. Yamanaka, thank you. Let's give him a big round of applause again. Uh, we'll have a five-minute break, and while、uh, during this、uh, break, I would like to show you the geocosmos demonstration. Symposium will restart in ten minutes. Housekeeping announcements. We have a five-minute break. After the five-minute break, there will be a demonstration of.、Uh,
同時通訳機をお持ちでないお客様。If you don't have the interpretation receiver, please talk to your staff nearby. Thank you. Now we'd like to proceed to the second part of the program. So please、uh, come up to the stage. Thank you. So please be seated. Thank you. So, in the second half of, half of this program, while drinking tea in a casual way, to Chat like you can feel like at home. So, as if you were sitting in this part to drink tea together,、uh, in a, this is a green tea.、Uh, please open the lid. Dr. Wilmot, do you like green tea? Hi, Mo. Hi, Arigato g o z a i m a s Thank you. Now, for the second part, Is using internet bulletin and also comic,、uh, many things to be in talking about the biotechnology based on these materials from the internet and so on. And for the, on the internet bulletin board, a certain story that I will talk about that. As you see, this picture is what actually I have written. In the large、uh, internet bulletin board called Channel 2, and this is a topic about the electric eel. This is a picture of the electric eel, and from this eel to make the skin to make, produce the IPS cell, then what do you associate with the electric eel? Yes, to be able to generate electricity by the eel, but actually, is the 300 watt output is possible. But for a few seconds, or maybe one seventh time, it's a very short time, but it is possible to generate the electricity. So, by culturing the cell, or may be able to create the power generation, is the idea from the general public to create or produce electricity from the electric eel using IPS cell. So, they may be unthinkable. So, Dr. Wilmot, Do you think this would be possible to do such a way to produce IPS cell to generate electricity? Maybe this is a diff difficult question, but what do you think? I think we could probably do very interesting things with cells from electric eels or any other animal, but I'm not sure if you'd be able to make electricity. Thank you. Dr. Yamanaka, what do you think of this idea? In previously, drug discovery or medicine, you were thinking of IPS cell, but for this type of energy generation, do you think is it possible to do this type of energy generation? Well, <laughs> well I think there is a possibility, there may be a possibility to, to do that. So maybe it is possible. But in terms of economics, I'm not sure whether, <laughs> like wind, compared to wind power generation or solar generation, there may be advantages or not, I don't know. But this type of electricity, these ideas are needed because uh, 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 ourselves or、uh, those who have a very flexible,、uh, even with the age of 50, but if you think, look back your 30s and 40s, I think more, we feel much more inflexible in our brains in an aging time. So it's not just to say that it's not possible,、uh, but that is quite in inflexible, and that is most of the people. So, what I mean is the flexibility in your thinking is very important. When I went to USA, I heard some very well known professor saying in his very famous research lab, 
in a very innovative work was done in his research lab but but regardless of the research lab in science this most of the innovative works in science is actually produced by the young researchers or student when they want to set those ideas and then his boss or her boss may say no but actually those the thing that those uh, boss said no but there was a uh, possibility mentioned idea mentioned by the young people actually made into very great research and work so that is what I have heard so we should not just say this is absurd no I don't think so these ideas uh, should not be blocked and, and, and uh, to pursue and that is very important I think thank you explain my concern in the part of England where I, I grew up people would say I'll say it in the regional English and then in plain English you don't get out for naught and what that means you don't get anything for nothing so, so if you were going to have electricity coming out of there what would you have to put in to get the electricity I see and in the body there are many different type of cells in the human body for example this is a cell to generate electricity but then in human being we have so many different diversified type of the cell Dr. Wilmot and Dr. Yamanaka in doing the research the, the cells maybe it's out of your research scope but as any interesting cell as any particular cell that you love or you like in your uh, in, in the uh, so Dr. Wilmot which cell do you like or so interesting early embryo. The, the early embryo which is a tenth of a millimeter in diameter very similar in all species gives you all of the cells all of the tissues it can grow naturally into hair skin eyes bone everything and it's just a single cell which divides a few times to start with and still retains that ability Thank you very much. Dr. Yamanaka, what do you think of interesting cell? For me, most interesting cell was the ES cell. In, when I was in America studying and researching, then I started to use that ES cell. It takes them from the uh, mated uh, fertilized egg and then to create that from the fertilized egg. When I was researching, I met that by coincidence but I really became fascinated, fascinated or passionate about it and then continued my research so for me ES cell, ES cell is the most interesting so for the human being uh, many animals and, and biological forms so why are they like to uh, come to learn about these functions what do you think of this question why do you think these uh, living things acquire these functions or these cells? Why do cells acquire these functions? I think it's the result of a million years of evolution with them becoming more specialized, acquiring particular skills that are necessary for the animal or the plant to function properly. Thank you. Dr. Yamanaka, what do you think? Well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know is my answer. Yeah, because it is not known scientifically, we do not know. So maybe just uh, taking the, drinking the tea to enjoy and relax. Well, when I think of that type of issue, I wonder why do we exist? Like, I mean, oh, among biologists, ultimately speaking, we are sort of existing to inherit our genes to the next generations, some people say. So even our, our body is just a, a temporary thing where genes are inherited. So we are maybe just a tool in that thinking. 
and some people think in that way. So, so we may not have to exist in that type of thinking. And it's a very difficult question that you have asked. But thank you for answering my question. Thank you. Now, it may be overlapped with what just Dr. Yamanaka mentioned. I'd like to proceed to the next topic. Do you like comics? Cartoons? Do you like cartoons? Any, oh, many people like cartoons from the kids to the adults. In Japan, from the children all the way to the adults, people read comics. Dr. Wilmot, in the UK, do p adults also read comics? Well, less, less maybe than used to be when, when I was a boy, because I think now there are a lot of things on the television and movies. Any particular type of comic do you like, Dr. Wilmot? Any particular type of comic do you like, Dr. Wilmot? Um, wouldn't be known, known here. There was a cartoonist, cartoonist called Giles who wrote just single picture cartoons of life. And they were very clever at putting a current situation into a comic uh, situ uh, perspective. I see that is the, to show the uh, to reflect the society. Any Dr. Yamanaka, do you, any particular comic do you like? I do like various type of comics. It's the invention human being Giatos. Uh, it's called invention human being. I think many old, older people know that. Maybe the same generation as Dr. Yamanaka. The there's a, the meat of the mammoth is there, right? in the comic. So in talking about the comic, those representing the Osamu Tezuka is a very well-known cartoonist in Japan. And this he shows this mer uh, mysterious mermo by, so let me briefly introduce Osamu Tezuka. In 1928, he was born in Osaka. And from his experience in the war, he learned the very respectful aspect of the uh, human lives. But then the one occupation that he has done is the animation writers as well as the cartoonist. And using his uh, medical knowledge and his works is very much related to the various type of the medicine or human being. Have you ever seen this comic before? Uh, An An Mysterious Mermo is the name of the comic. Many adults. Uh, this is Melmo. When she eats uh, blue candy, she gets 10 years older. And if, when she eats uh, red candy, she gets 10 years younger. So she has this wonderful uh, candies. And uh, by eating these candies, she overcomes dif uh, various difficulties. Uh, this teacher uh, ate the candy uh, by mistake. And he said, give me the blue candy. And he ate candy. And the children are saying, where's the teacher? And this uh, girl, Melmo, is saying, I'll go check. And there are many uh, babies in the teacher's lounge. So, uh, so the teachers ate some um, uh, red candies. So. Osamu Tezuka, the cartoonist, was uh, thinking about the uh, aging or the youth, and then came up with this cartoon. Uh, aging happens to all the living things. Why the living things have this function to age? Sorry, another difficult uh, question. What do you think, Dr. Wilmot? My biology answer would be that selection acts to bring about animals that can grow and then can reproduce, but has no need for them afterwards. And so they age and, uh, and, and will disappear. This, this habit is a result of selection.
生物が進化の過程でやはり必要だから。In the process of uh, uh, evolution,、uh, that is the choice or selection that has to be made. How about you, Dr. Yamanaga? Why do people and things get old? Unless we get old or age, everyone s t a y as babies. And babies will not be born from babies. <laughs> right? <laughs> 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 so, my answer is I don't know. Okay. When you think about aging, what's happening in the cells? Are anything happening in the cells, Dr. Wilmot? Sure, there are lots of、uh, different things happening,、um, which will be different in different types of c e l l And I think one of the ambitions we would probably share. Would be to try to prevent the harmful effects of aging.、Um, I have no ambition to help people to live forever, but I think it would be good if we had a healthy life for as long as we're going to live. We all know people who have a very sad end to their lives because of degenerative disease, and it would be good if we could find a way of reducing the harm done by those diseases. Um, among, uh, in a cell, I heard that there is a part called telomere. It is the edge of uh, uh, the uh, cell, and as a cell divides, it gets shorter and shorter. Once this telomere is gone, no longer cells divide themselves. Does it have to do with、um, uh, aging, Dr. Yamanaka? For cells to divide themselves,、uh, genes have to be copied. In that process, the end of telomere gets shorter. It has to happen that way. With the current、uh, way of、um, gene copying and Cell division, cell aging comes from the shortening of telomere. That is a important factor.、Um, about clone、uh, Dolly, what was the telomere like for Dolly? Telomeres were short. They had the length of a six year old you. At the time when she was a few months old. And the you from which we took the cell was six years old. But this was exceptional, and we don't understand、uh, why this, this happened. There were some calves born in a completely separate experiment here in Japan that also had short telomeres. But those are the only two experiments I know where the telomeres were short. And、my colleagues did a systematic experiment taking cells which they grew for a long time so that the tel telomeres were shortened, then doing nuclear transfer and recovering cells, and those telomeres were totally normal length. So, in that detailed experiment,、um, it, they had been restored. So, we simply don't understand why Dolly had short telomeres. Thank you for your response. iPS、uh, cells uh, can uh, regenerate or proliferate、uh, indefinitely. What's happening with the telomere of iPS cells, Dr. Yamanaka?、Uh, from, uh, we, are making, uh, we had made、uh, iPS cells from a different donor of the cells, from five year old girl to eight year old、uh, ladies. We will first take the skin cell 
and uh, when we look at the telomere length of the skin cells, as uh, the donor is, gets older, the telomere is shorter, so you cannot uh, hide your age. But when the iPS cells are made, without exception, the telomere length is as long as zero-year-old person for all iPS cells. So at cell level, you can rejuvenate, but it's a totally different story from uh, rejuvenation of individual level. Thank you. Now, uh, Dr. Wilmot, would you like to ask a question to the audience? Dr. Wilmot. Let's look forward a few years. And let's imagine that you have a disease which could be treated with cells from iPS cells, but not in any other way. Would you like the treatment with iPS cells? Yes? No? First, yes. You've got a job. <laughs> I think 80% of the people raise their hands. Thank you. Next question. Uh, please look at this uh, cartoon. Oh, not this one. Uh, it's titled Phoenix. Have you ever seen this cartoon titled uh, Phoenix? Many people. Maybe one six. I would like to explain the story of the Phoenix. A Phoenix uh, um, when there is a, uh, a volcano, uh, once they go into the uh, volcano once in 100 years, and they re get re re rejuvenated by going into the vol volcano, uh, Phoenix has uh, eternal life, and they merge everywhere. Or oh, the Phoenix is universal. This is a future world. This person is uh, Masato Yamanobe. Uh, in the future, uh, people developed underground uh, town. Nobody is living above a ground. Uh, for some reason, Yamanobe escaped the underground and go above uh, ground. In uh, the underground, there was a nuclear war, and except for Yamanobe, everyone else dies. And Yamanobe meets this uh, phoenix. Phoenix gave an order. Yamanobe, you have to restore the population that uh, were totally destroyed, depleted. Masato says, do I have to restore the earth? It's impossible for me. How can I do that? Phoenix says, you are living. You have to make sure that a people, a population get restored. And this Phoenix make a Masato. Uh, uh, Phoenix gave a eternal life to Masato. This person, Masato, well, is the only person living on the Earth. So the, the only cells on Earth is the one from Masato. Can we generate cells for fish or animals from a human cells? Dr. Wilmot. It would be challenging. Um, very complicated biology that you're asking us to do. I, th I think it will take a while. Within a, a single person in the process of uh, evolution, 
there may be a uh, genes uh, when people were fish or uh, a reptile before. We will we, we still have that genes. By using such uh, remnant genes, can we make fish? Will it be difficult? It would certainly be very difficult, but the point that you're making is quite, quite right. I understand your point that um, there are points in our development when we look like um, other species, including fish. So there is a period when we have gills um, before the lungs uh, develop. Uh, and I can imagine there is the exciting thought that it might be possible to do this, but it would be difficult. Thank you very much. Dr. Yamanaka, what do you think of this point? Well, for the life forms, the encryption to the lives, lives is the genes that this has come to know. All of them have DNA. By DNA, it is determined by DNA. So DNA is can be synthesized. So in that sense, in reality, Dr. Kleck Benta, he has first discovered and determined the genome of human being, and now he's trying to do the artificial life forms, very uh, uh, primitive uh, life forms to be synthesized to DNA, and then to do that type of research is being done by him. But it's very pri primary one, or very uh, primary one is very difficult. So it's very, so G is the DN uh, encryption, but it's, it's quite primitive. But then can we get that to use that uh, uh, encryption to, but we still have lots of secret or unknown. So for the human being, uh, we may have, I'm not sure whether we can reach someday, whether we can understand everything. Also, there's another question whether should we understand everything? That's another question. I'm sorry, I don't know. It's a little bit like nuclear transfer. Now, I said very early on that you need two cells. You need genetic information, but you need other things around the genetic information to uh, to guide what, what, what happens. So, so the um, things that you would need would be uh, a huge number of different proteins and other molecules organized into a, an egg and all of the genetic information for, let's say, a fish in, in order for it to, be, to, to develop. Um, it's an interesting thought experiment to do as to what you would need. Um, but I think it would be misleading to imply that it could be done. It's a little bit similar to the suggestion that we might recover a mammoth because there are frozen cells recovered from the ice, the deep ice, where the cells have been frozen for hundreds of years. Um, it's much easier than the, the, what you're asking us to do, but you may be able to get the chromosomes of a mammoth Let's assume that they're intact. But in order to get a mammoth, you need to have an egg that you can put that information into so that the egg can, can function and so on. But then you need to have a mother that you can put the embryo into. And the evidence is that the two species for the genetic information and the surrogate mother need to be closely related, otherwise it doesn't work. And, and so the very tight biological limitations on what we can achieve in, in reality. Thank you very much. Then, for the, we talked about the life forms, living creatures, but then through best research for the people's conscious has been changed to act like that, Dr. Yamanak, whether you are thinking about the life forms have changed through your research. Well, um, 
I'm sorry, it's a very difficult question, an extremely difficult question you're asking. Um, I don't know if this could be answered to the question, but let's say, look at just like this comic cartoon, you may, one can may be able to live thousands of years, or you can start from zero so many, many, many times as you like. If that is true, then does it lead to the happiness, however, uh, is another question. And that's a very difficult question we are thinking about. Even if you li live long time, it is about 100 years or so. But because it's only 100 years, people may work hard or try a lot of things because you only have 100 years. But if you have hundreds of years of longevity or thousands of years, then if you can restart again, if that is the case, is it really happy? Does it really make people happy? It may not be happy that case. But the one thing I could say, however, is that it, one can live thousands of years. I don't know if it's good or bad, but, but in general, 80 years, 90 years, or 100 years to reach that longevity. And then, and for the time being, people, a lot of people can live in a very healthy way. That is my wish and our wish, and the, the purpose of the uh, uh, research, to be able to make that medicine available. So it's not like this resolution where it's not like us who are trying to make the longevity much longer, or it's not like making the make the restart. Uh, but that's a completely misunderstanding about our research, because it, you need to enjoy your life. It's only once, and 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 if you become 50 years old, and one may uh, just can I move anymore because of this is called ALS, but how can we work uh, to reduce such uh, disease? And, and that is uh, what I we're trying to do the research on. So this could be uh, e easily uh, indicative of the misunderstanding. Of course, using the comic may be a good way, but I do not wish this type of information to give misunderstanding because it's a, it's a fiction, it's a comic. So. As Dr. Wilmot has mentioned, the research of the clone is not really aiming for the phoenix because there are people who have disease such as cannot st stop bleeding or in terms of disease in certain, uh, in the hemo hemophilia and the uh, hemophilia and uh, all those. But if we can try to crea create that artificially, it takes a huge amount of money, a cost. And with that all money, you cannot still, but if you have the more generic uh, dolly type of technology and to be able to produce milk and then people can be cured with much less uh, uh, medical expense and that is what is uh, trying to do so this comparison is not uh, it, it's, it should not be mistaken with such a technology with this type of the comic uh, uh, a cartoon idea that's so please I do not wish that to be led to misunderstanding the actual science is different from the, this type of... Co uh, so, Dr. Wehrmann, what do you think of such idea? Do you, is your perception toward human life forms that our life forms has changed because of research? So, have, have life forms changed because of research? I, I don't think so. I think what we have is a better opportunity to live to our potential. Um, and. I would hope that we can improve that even more. Um, I'm about 68 years old. So people who were around when I was born were suffering from infectious diseases which we can now control, like polio, tuberculosis, whooping cough, measles, a whole range of different diseases which can be treated either with immunization or antibiotics, which were not really available for those infections when I was a baby. There's really no reason why anybody anywhere in the world should suffer from these now. They do in the poorer parts of the world, but there's no need why that should continue. We could spread the benefit 
round the world, which would be extremely useful and fair. Now, now you can see diseases which reflect either the death of cells or the loss of normal function of cells, like motor neurons disease, Parkinson's disease, type 1 diabetes. There are actually hundreds of these sorts of degenerative diseases. And there isn't really a fully effective treatment for any of them. And what we could look forward to, the younger people in the room, sorry to the older people, what we can look forward to is a time when many of these will be treatable. So that in the same way, somebody sitting here now can look back and say, in my lifetime, infectious diseases have been controlled. In 50 years time, let's say, somebody might sit here and say, the degenerative diseases have been controlled. Most of, sorry. And I think we should be excited by that. All of the older people in the room know somebody who's had one of the diseases I've mentioned. I, I'm sorry, probably some of you are suffering from them. And so I think we should be excited by the possibility of having enough new knowledge, which will often involve using IPS cells to be able to offer effective treatments for these diseases. And we should be excited by that. Thank you very much. So for today's event, uh, please uh, tweet your uh, impressions, comment to the tweet, to this hashtag. So lastly, I'd like to ask Dr. Yamanaka, as Dr. Ian Wilmot, I'd like to ask your message to the audience. Uh, please stand. Uh, to the stage on the front. So, Dr. Jan Wilmot, uh, please give your message to the audience. Or particularly to the younger people in the audience. Some of you may go on to be scientists, but you might also be politicians or doctors, business people, whatever it is that you choose to be. I would urge you to be ambitious. Think what it is that you can possibly achieve. Because whatever it is that you're doing, if you aim your sights high, if you look in the long term, which is actually what Shinya did beautifully, he started an experiment which if you listen to the years, it took five years to do. He set you a great example of what you can achieve if you are ambitious. So I would encourage you to be ambitious and I would wish you good luck. Thank you very much. Dr. Yamanaka, we are <coughs> just below this um, globe. Well, I cannot look up because I hurt my neck uh, playing rugby, but anyways. We are a part of the Earth. We are living in a wonderful planet. We don't, I don't want to forget this fact. And I am proud to be a Japanese person. And at the same time, I am one of uh, many living things on Earth. Just like uh, Dr. Wilmot, I would like to say to the young people, just don't just look at Japan, but please look at the whole planet. Uh, by the way, in Yokohama, there was a gathering of uh, cancer cell specialists. More than 3,000 came to that uh, meeting. There was internet uh, link, and things get borderless day by day. So physically, Japan is a small country, but 
uh, do not contain yourself within this small country, go out. You are Japanese, but you are a global, uh, you are a member of the Earth. If you look Japan from outside, you could change your ideas and thinking about Japan and Japanese people. That happened to me. When I was living in Japan, uh, we hear often hear bad news, recession, etc., uh, etc. Et it seems that Japan as a gold days are already passed. We are on the roll or, or we are declining, rolling down the hill. But if you go to other parts of the world, things are different. I was in Saudi Arabia uh, last March 11th. Uh, people from Saudi Arabia well, were very much impressed by Japanese people. They heard the news about this uh, big earthquake and tsunami on, uh, on the news, and they were impressed by how Japanese people are calm and stoic. So by going outside of Japan, you can learn different things. Therefore, please uh, go out of Japan and see Japan from outside. I'd like to thank everyone for this opportunity. I, what kind of future would you like to form using IPS cells? Uh, that's your homework. Dr. Ian Wilmot, Dr. Shinya Nakayama, thank you very much for your uh, participation in this event.